thinking about it a little bit more seriously in the past month, and we've only started prescribing it on a very ad hoc basis, again, very physician dependent over the past two weeks. So I really can't say very much about hydroxychloroquine, except that say the patient is not eligible for trial and it's already week two, week three of illness, and therefore we're thinking, well, Calitra and Sofran may not work anymore, then maybe we might consider hydroxychloroquine. But if the patient is very old and has got cardiac risk factors and the PTC you know, is a bit borderline, we may not even offer hydroxychloroquine. So our experience okay. is, is, is not uniform. That's all I can say. Uniform. And yeah. uh, there are a lot of questions about therapy. So I think people ask about antibiotics. I think acetromycin has been tried in combination hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Yeah, we... we uh, there are comments about yeah. Uh, yeah. plasma as well. So yeah. I, I think the summary is that all this are uh, not evidence-based. It's quite anecdotal. The evidence so far is quite mixed. Uh, yeah. The recommendation so far is that you want to start this therapy, it should be discussed in patient and probably started as a protocol so you can collect data and show whether it's useful in the future, yeah. including some of this traditional Chinese medicine that has been tried and used uh, across China. I think we need much more data to show usefulness. I think we really don't know. I think what Dr. Zhou said is perfect. Beyond supportive therapy is Star Trek zone, I think. Uh, we're not sure. So I want to move on a little bit. Uh, there's this question popping out about, I saw in Dr. Cho's slide, hypertension patients uh, consist of 50% of this group of patients. Uh, and what is your advice? Should this group of patients stop their ACE inhibitor because there's some association with ACE inhibitor use ARB as an entrance uh, pathway for the COVID virus? I wonder whether Dr. Cho or Dr. Koji has any comments uh, or advice to the audience regarding hypertension and COVID? Dr. Joseph? Uh, I have some kind of slide. Yeah, Dr. Koji, you want to share your slides if possible? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. So maybe just one or two slides on this topic. Yes, uh, just uh, because uh, I am representing the uh, cardiovascular pharmacotherapy. Uh, well, just I will speak about the, uh, briefly about the anti-hypertensive uh, uh, drugs and uh, COVID-19. And, you know, uh, as already Dr. Zhou uh, described, the hypertension is very common in COVID-19 patients. And also that the 48% of known survivors had hypertension and 23% uh, of survivors have uh, hypertension. The odd ratio of hypertension for death is uh, more than three. And also in Europe, uh, it has been reported that uh, more than 70% of the uh, died patients have hypertension. So the, the hypertension is uh, very common in non survivors in COVID-19. So uh, maybe that the hypertension is also common in old high age patient, but uh, let's go to the uh, hypothesis of the ACE2, uh, angiotensin combating enzyme 2, uh, which is actually the protective molecule, uh, but which it has been also shown that ACE2 serves as a receptor uh, for the uh, SARS coronavirus 2. And uh, also, uh, it is shown that the angiotensin combating enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers upregulate the expression of ACE2. So, uh, this fact led to the hypothesis that the patients receiving ACE inhibitor or ARB are more susceptible or uh, more uh, opportunity to be infected by SARS coronavirus 2. So uh, there are a number of uh, discussions for this hypothesis and against uh, for th uh, on this hypothesis. And for this hypothesis, the patient treated with ACE inhibitor or ARB may be at higher risk of COVID-19. And so that the calcium channel blockers could be a suitable alternative for the hypertension treatment. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 
at present, uh, it is unclear whether the hypostasis could be at, at applied to human, therefore, ACE inhibitor or ALD uh, should be continued as a, until further uh, data are available. But many societies uh, is against for this hypostasis, including ESC, AHA, ACC, and Heart Failure Society of America states that uh, there, at present, there is no clinical or scientific evidence to suggest that treatment with ACE inhibitor or ALD should be discontinued uh, because of the COVID-19. But uh, very few data are available, but uh, one published uh, data is available on the use of ACE inhibitor and ALD. And the title of the uh, paper is uh, The Cardiovascular Implications of the Fatal Outcome of Patient with uh, Coronavirus Disease 2019, COVID-19. And basically, uh, in this paper, uh, the elevated troponin T levels are associated with death. So uh, if the troponin is high, the mortality is around 60%. And if the troponin level is normal, the mortality is around 9%. And uh, with the use of ACE inhibitor or ALD, the high elevated uh, troponin is 21%. And the uh, normal troponin level, uh, the use of ACE inhibitor or ALD was 6%. This was a significant difference. P-value is uh, 0.002. And also the mortality rate, uh, the use of ACE inhibitor or ARD was 37%. And if uh, the patient did not uh, uh, receive uh, this drug, uh, the mortality is 26%. Uh, this difference is not significant. But uh, the uh, elevated troponin T levels uh, in patient receiving ACE inhibitor or ALD might be attribu attributable to that the heart failure patient often receiving this drug. So at present, we are not sure uh, the elevation of the troponin T is attributable to the spe specific effect of S inhibitor or ALD, or due to the uh, more often in uh, high heart failure patients are included in uh, elevated troponin T group. So this is a tentative conclusion, not uh, conclusive, just a hypothesis. At present, there's no clinical evidence to show that uh, ACE inhibitor uh, ALD results in fatal outcome in COVID-19 patients. Uh, right now, the clinical trials are ongoing, but uh, uh, we cannot uh, rule out the possibility that these drugs will increase the uh, susceptibility or opportunity uh, to be infected by SARS coronavirus too. So, and also the hypertension or heart failure are also common in high age patients. So, uh, these patients need to be carefully followed up on COVID 19. And the lastly, this is my personal perspective to be discussed. Uh, if the patient, uh, hypertension patient is stable, uh, I would say just to consider to change S inhibitor or LD into other drugs. But the heart failure patient, and apparently uh, there is a clear evidence that S inhibitors or LD are beneficial for heart in heart failure patients. So uh, at present, uh, uh, we should continue uh, uh, this agent. That is a personal perspective, uh, but we need the further evidence for that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Prof. Koji. That's very succinct. Uh, can I just uh, have a quick word from Dr. Zhou Ning? What is the practice in China? Do you switch the patients um, away from ARBs or ACE inhibitor? Yeah. That's a very controversial uh, talk. So far, uh, we never stopped the use of LB or ACI for those hypertensive patients or the heart failure patients uh, uh, of the COVID-19 patient. So 
we still continue to use these drugs in the in the COVID nineteen patient. Yeah. So you there's no change in practice. I think this is consistent with all the major societal guidelines that uh, I think the the fear or this presumptive uh, change may cause more harm to the hypertension patient are not well treated. So I'd like to take one more uh, bundle of questions before I move on to Dr. Ling's lecture before I close up to address the other questions. The next bundle which I'll ask opinions from the faculty, especially Dr. Cho, is how to tackle troponin P, B and T and tying with, with ECMO use. For example, your patient um, clearly had troponin T as well as BNP rise and depressed LVEF. And in this group of patients, is the criteria more for BB ECMO to address the hypoxemia or VA ECMO to address the cardiogenic component, noting that the pH was low, he was having high lactate. Clearly, he has some form of cardiogenic uh, collapse as well. So when do you decide on BB versus BA? Do you do troponin T or I for, as a routine for all cases? And only if possible, do the BNP or is this routine for all patients or only for the sick patients? Dr. Cho? Yeah, that's a very, very important, also very interesting problem. So before we did the uh, implementation of ECMO for the patient, absolutely we need to test the echo and the ECG and also the BNP troponin uh, for him. So preferably, I use the VB ECMO for the COVID, very severe COVID-19 patient because for the COVID nineteen patient, the most the, the biggest problem is the respiratory failure. That means hypoxemia. So most patient has a very severe hypoxemia caused by the respiratory failure, but not the, the heart problem. Oh, of course, the heart problem is very important. But for those who has a respiratory failure and a heart failure, uh, evidenced by a very high BMP, a very significant uh, myocardial injury. Uh, as the, the troponin and the troponin I or troponin T increase very much, for those patients, we were, we would to change into a VA ECMO. But for my patient, I have five cases, just one VA ECMO because his BMP is very high. It's o over 10,000, uh, over, over almost 1,000. Oh, no, 10,000, yeah, 10,000. So at that time, I would like to use the VA ECMO for, for our circulatory uh, support for the patient. But, uh, as my, uh, according to my experience, VV ECMO may be better than VA ECMO for a very regular COVID-19 patient. Yeah. So it's also easier to use uh, less morbidity and uh, potentially you can consider a weak uh, uh, and then uh, exhibit this group of patient if the VV ECMO does eventually the oxygenation well for this group of patient, more comfortable for them as well. Um, so there's a lot of other questions uh, just to find my faculty, they are talking about what is considered adequate PP for frontliners. China has a lot of experience and you have a lot of frontliners who are infected. And I think there's a lot of uh, myths out there about what is considered adequate PP. This part I will probably get um, Dr. Ling as well as Dr. Cho, as well as Dr. Lam to share their experience about what, what do you feel safe as a PP for healthcare workers. So we'll start with Dr. Ho first. In Hong Kong, uh, what is a PPE that you think is adequate for healthcare workers? Yeah. Uh, regarding the PPE issue, I think there are many experts uh, They will talk about that. Uh, maybe I mainly focus on the PPE in cat lab in this issue. For I've checked most of the PPE that we use in cat lab actually is a level three. I suppose it's uh, water resistant, but this is just water resistant. It's not waterproof. If you uh, put some water over it, it's okay, and the water will not go in. However, if you have prolonged contact time with the blood during the PCI inside the lab, maybe in also in other clinical work, when you have prolonged contact time with liquid, actually water or blood can uh, cause your PPE. That is something you need to be very careful. Many of the time we take the PPE, go to do the PCI, and then after that, after the gun, and then the uh, supporting staff will we found some butt on our apron. So be careful of that. Um, the PPE is level three. Prolonged contact of water, uh, liquid, it can diffuse inside your body. Uh, that is something uh, I recently found out. So for now, just to clarify, your PPE is uh, N95 mask, uh, mask over your eyes, uh, full yeah, gown, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, if, does it do PAPR or no? 
if we do suspect case, we will use N95 and persuasive and uh, also a cover of the hair, everything. But not a hazmat uh, suit, right? Only a hazmat suit, just a gown, mm -hmm. is it? No, no waterproof gowns in Hong Kong. Just uh, no, so far no. Now uh, our strategy is try the best to avoid to do a uh, PCI for concerned COVID case or suspected sure. case. Try medical treatment uh, unless you can. Um, Dr. Cho, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Dr. Cho, you want to share on the PPE in China for the frontline staff? We can't mm -hmm. hear you. Are you muted, Dr. Cho? I think you are. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very, very similar to Dr. Lam uh, in Hong Kong. We use the uh, very very strict uh, the uh, infection con control in the cat lab and also in the world. We actually we just finished two cases of the uh, STEMI patient uh, with a COVID-19 patient in in the cat lab because of the, the the very severe condition because the patient have a cardiogenic shock. We did the thrombolysis for him, but. Um, but the, the uh, circulation is still very bad. So we have to choose the um, PCI for him. We don't have the negative pressure uh, case lab so far. So uh, just to reconstruct our case lab to, I mean, to, to prevent as much as we can to protect our uh, medical personnel working in the case lab, we close the AC, we, we close the AC we close. Uh, we, we shut down the AC. We, we close the windows, the, the the doors, and seal them. And also, we use uh, the third the third grade uh, protective method. That means that we we use a protect suit, we use the N95 mask, and also with another uh, surgical mask covered with N95. And also the goggles, the the water uh, the water the goggles, and also the face shield. And then we cover every skin of the body. And and that and in this case, I think we can. Uh, decrease the possibility to be infected as much as, as we can. But I don't think that uh, the regular PCI for the STEMI patient is a good choice for our cardiologists because we cannot uh, to make sure that the, uh, we cannot be infected in the cat lab because the cat lab is a very small zoom. It's, it's, I mean, the, 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 the airflow, the airflow is not so uh, fluent. So I don't think, I think that's a very high risk for us. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Dr. Holam previously shared also, uh, the problem across all cath lab is a positive pressure. I think China showed us some example where they build barriers at the exit to prevent it because actually the moment the door opens, everything is exercised in the control room outside and the circulation, yeah. you, you can't really. So I, I think uh, it's very tricky to do COVID positive patients. I think a lot of countries have moved on to thrombolysis if appropriate for the STEMI patients and only in hemodynamic unstable patients for the ACS patients do we uh, bring a COVID patients into the cath lab. There are a lot of repercussions for Can I just well. make a comment? Yes, uh, Dr. Kobe. Yes. Uh, uh, many people are asking about the elevation of the uh, troponin level and also yes. myocardial injury. So uh, I just like to ask uh, Dr. Do, is it uh, very easy to differentiate uh, myocarditis and uh, acute myocardial infarction due to uh, coronary thrombus? Because in most mm. patients, uh, the troponin are uh, elevated and also some kind of uh, uh, change of electrocardiogram will occur. So it may be very difficult to uh, differentiate diagnosis of uh, myocarditis and uh, acute myocardial infarction due to uh, coronary thrombus. Excellent question, Prof. Uh, um, have, Dr. Uh, Cho, do you have any uh, answer to that one? Yeah, I, I, full, yeah, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Kochi about the differentiation uh, of STEMI and the uh, increased troponin I or troponin T induced by the hypoxemia. You know, so, you know, that's very difficult for us to do the angiography uh, very emergently. So uh, we used the echo, we used the ECG, and also we used other kind of the, the examination to differentiate uh, why the patient have a myocardial injury. Is due to the primary coronary heart disease or is just a secondary uh, phenomenon caused by the hypoxemia or the infections. So that's very difficult for us to differentiate. So it need to be a, need a very comprehensive uh, judgment. 
do you see in those uh, troponin positive patients ECG changes of pericarditis or ischemia, or is it very non-specific? Uh, it's not a very so common. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we we already finished the the, the analysis of the patient with a, a normal ECG when they has a very high troponin I, and uh, we found that around thirty percent, only thirty percent have a ST elevation, but most of them are ST depression. So, uh, you know, ST depression doesn't make many sense. Because the hypoxemia infections and the other kind of the like a heart failure, some patient with heart failure can also have a ST uh, depression. But for those has ST elevation, we need also think uh, uh, furthermore. Like, is it a myocardial infarction or is it a myocarditis? You know, a lot of myocarditis can also have a ST elevation, especially for those my, uh, family myocarditis. You know, this patient is a inflammatory storm. The inflammatory storm can also lead to a myocarditis, especially for those very young patients. Be very, very careful. If you find the ST elevation in a very young patient, and the troponin is extremely higher, so be careful. Maybe it's a family myocarditis because the differentiation of family myocarditis is very difficult, especially for those you cannot tell whether it's a myocarditis or whether it's a, it's a coronary heart disease. That's very difficult to tell it. There's an interesting question from Alan Fong, Malaysia, addressed probably to Dr. Cho. So, you know, Wuhan now is lifted, is locked down. And of course, everyone is waiting to see whether COVID can get back to China again. What are the measures? For example, do you PCR test every case that come to your cardiology clinic or for elective PCI now or for elective surgery? Do you do routine tests for all patients who find procedures now, <laughs> even if they're well? Uh, that's very interesting. So, uh, so far we uh, we we already returned to a very regular uh, clinical work. So, uh, at that, at this time, for any patient who need to be admitted to in into our ward, they need to uh, be tested by the virus virus as well as the antibody before the admission. Uh, that's just for sure. They are not the asymptomatic infections. You know, some of the patient who actually is a virus carrier, and uh, this patient is also infectious. I don't know how infectious they are, but they are infectious. So to prevent the, uh, the spread of the virus, we need to be very, very careful to do as much as we can uh, for the virus test for for those patients. And, so China uh, yeah, that's test, also test, very test, important test. for the protection of the virus test. As much as we can. So, so I know China function on test, 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 test. And I think uh, Po Lam tells me Hong Kong function on mask, 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 mask. Everyone must put on a mask as well. Um, Anna Ruka from uh, Thailand is asking about, just to clarify, Dr. Cho, uh, positive pressure in the care flat. So, you shut down the positive pressure and do full PPE before you do COVID patients. Do you turn off the positive pressure in the care flat? Before you do patients, COVID here positive, Dr. Cho? Uh, you mean turn off what? The positive pressure in the cath lab. Do you shut it oh. down? Sh shut it down, yes, shut it down. Okay, so you shut it down. Okay, yes. good. Um, I think there's actually a lot of questions uh, that I think we'll just take one more from Dr. Kenneth Poor from Singapore asking, do we, should we do ECG in all patients who uh, under the swap and send home program. Uh, Dr. Ling, do you want to take that one? Should we do ECG for all the patients who require URTI, fever, swap and go? No. I mean, we, of course we have to look at the patient. I mean, the quick answer is no. Okay, um, good. I like that one. You, but you've got to look at the patient profile, right? If it's an elderly patient with multiple comorbids and, and if there is any evidence of cardiac symptoms, then yes. But if it is a young person, and quite a lot of our COVID patients in Singapore are, are fairly young without any comorbids, then there's no reason to do routine ECG just because they come in for acute respiratory symptoms. Yeah. Good. Uh, there's uh, this other side track uh, question. Any precautions to be yes. used during yes. autopsy? Can I have uh, one question? Yes, 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 please, uh, Prof. Yeah. Uh, yeah, do you have 
is anybody have a uh, data on the uh, antibody against the COVID-19? So many people will check the uh, COVID-19 PCR, but uh, Europe uh, or America are going to use the uh, antibody checking. Uh, so this is a good, great yeah. question, Dr. Ling. Do you want to take that? Uh, what's yeah. the value of serology on TOS? So, yeah. So, so far, some of the, so we have done some testing and so to summarize some of the findings that was found was that, uh, so for serologies, we've got IgM and IgG, okay? So for diagnostics, really, I don't think, this is what, this is um, our take on it. For diagnostics, meaning that to diagnose someone as a new COVID patient, especially if it seems to be within the first 14 days of symptoms, the serology has not performed very well. The sensitivity ranges for IgG is less than 50%. For IgM is maybe about 80% towards the, towards the end of the two week. But if it is say um, beyond two weeks of symptoms, okay, and say your PCR is continuously negative, then there might be a role for serology because the IgG positivity beyond the 12 to the 14 days of illness rises quite significantly to close to about 100% sensitivity. So, mm -hmm. so to summarize that all, if it's very early on in disease within the first week, probably no point doing serology, you're not going to get a positive result. And even if you didn't get a positive result, if you got a positive, good. If you got a negative, it doesn't exclude. Mm -hmm. But say if we fail to diagnose the fail to diagnose a patient with a positive PCR and is still symptomatic beyond two weeks or the clinical picture is very like COVID, as in PCR negative, got fever, CT shows nodules, it's two, weeks of, two weeks of symptoms, yes, proceed with the serology. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, in the future for place like Wuhan where there was high prevalence in the population, maybe beyond screening Hep B, HIV, they need a IgG COVID uh, antibody to come safely back to the hospital for procedures. So um, I, I think we have a lot of questions, but I want to give some time to, for especially for the Singapore audience and whoever is interested in the Singapore data, for Dr. Ling to do her presentation, to share the Singapore experience and some of our cross-sharing in Singapore. Uh, Dr. Ling, uh, will you be okay to share your slides? Yep, okay, so I share my slides now, yeah? Hang on. The questions were coming fast and furious, so the Q&A okay. took a bit longer, but uh, we will yep. spend uh, the next 10 minutes or so for Dr. Ling to just share across uh, the Singapore experience as well. Then we'll see whether there are any more questions that we can group together and uh, take. Um, and of course, my faculty, uh, Prof. Koji gave a lot of good questions. And uh, Ho Lam and uh, Dr. Cho, you can uh, discuss among ourselves as well as uh, Dr. Ling puts up the slide. I don't know why, but I cannot seem to find my slides. As in, no, we did a practice time. session uh, I'm going to take other questions first. Um, um, is, is there any difference? Do you, do you have any precaution when you do autopsy for the patients in China? This question was quite interesting and it popped up. I don't know whether Dr. Cho, you have, uh, are the patients uh, double back or they don't do autopsy on this group of patients who dies? Dr. Cho, uh, are you muted or okay? Dr. Cho? Uh, excuse me. I can hear you right now. Uh, it's okay. Um, so I think Dr. Ling's uh, slides are up. We'll, we'll okay. get Dr. Ling to present first. Yep. Okay, thank you very much for your invitation. I'll try to go through these slides quick, as quickly as I can, can so that there's- Full screen sharing. Maybe you can go- Full screen screen. sharing. Uh, this it's is a PDF. Sure. Uh, oh, PDF, right? it's okay. It's all right. Is it? Is that? Is that okay? Let oh, me that's go fine, That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. So I'm just gonna. Um, this is the outline of my talk today. We'll just um, give a brief uh, situational update of what's happening in Singapore. Um, some profile of a descriptive analysis of some of the profiles of cases that we're seeing at NCID. Um, we'll also discuss a little bit about chest X-ray changes in some of the sicker patients, um, as well as viral shedding overall. 
I'll discuss a little bit also about the experience with Kalitra and interferon that we've had so far. And then maybe just to describe the incidence of hypokalemia and some cardiac complications in the ICU patient. So I have to say it's fairly timely that we had, that Singapore had NCID, the National Center for Infectious Diseases, built um, to help us manage um, our fight or battle against um, any pandemic. So it's really timely that we had this because this building really was officially opened only from September 2019 onwards. Okay, so very timely for this pandemic. Now, um, in terms of the facilities that we have, um, there is about 64 cohort beds with 100 isolation beds and 124 NEP beds, okay? Certainly, these are all scalable such that in the event that we need more beds, they could be double deck, so two beds in a single room, to such that we may be able to accommodate more than 500 patients that needs to be isolated. Okay. Situational update, so this is updated as of 14th of April. Um, up to that point in time, we had about, in total in Singapore, 3,252 cases, of which about 1,500 was admitted to NCID. The rest were admitted to various public hospitals as well as a few private hospitals. In terms of age, the median age is around 35. Um, I think at this point in time, this median age has been brought down simply because of the fact that we've had um, dormitory workers, um, the, there's been clusters of dormitory workers affected, and a lot of these dormitory workers are fairly young. Their median age ranges between 20 to 40 thereabouts. Okay? And therefore, it's not surprising that our percentage of uh, males affected have also gone up to about 77%, okay, of which 82% are locally acquired. Now, um, looking at the number of patients that required ICU, so this is updated until 14th of April, about 2% required ICU, okay, and they stayed for a median of six days, and this was looking at 24 ICU, um, ICU patients. Um, symptom onset to ICU admission was about eight days. Symptom, um, symptom onset, meaning respiratory symptom onset to ICU admission was about eight days. Okay. Symptom onset to oxygen requirement. So from nine days from respiratory symptoms to requiring oxygen was about nine days. What about the incidence of abnormal chest X-ray? So we looked at uh, um, the first 177 patients, um, about 3.4 on admission, didn't have x-rays, but subsequently they did. So for these patients, the first chest x-ray, about two thirds initially had a normal x-ray. Okay, subsequently, um, they did progress to abnormal x-ray. Now, in terms of how, what was the percentage of people that had normal or rather abnormal x-ray, I just wanted to point out that in the younger age groups, right, um, even when they needed oxygen or when they were in ICU, their very first chest X-ray, so say people in their 30s, 25% that required oxygen, um, had only 25% had abnormal chest X-ray, okay? And 13% of our ICU patients in younger age groups, their very first chest X-ray was actually abnormal and only 13%, okay? But subsequently, as, as their progression went on, Yes, they developed abnormal chest x um, um, a, a higher percentage developed abnormal chest X-ray. But as you can see in the older age group, so in the 60s to the 70s, um, upon presentation, a much higher percentage had abnormal chest X-ray. So we just wanted to point out that it is not uncommon that for some of our younger patients, when they have respiratory symptoms, when they come in, they may actually have normal chest X-ray. But if your clinical suspicion is high, say they have mild thrombocytopenia or they've been living in a cluster of COVID patients, please do do the testing and do zero chest X-ray to, to monitor for progression. Now, this is uh, some data that is uh, that Barnaby Young and his group did. Barnaby is one of our ID consultants and the manuscript has been submitted for review. So he reviewed the first 100 Singapore patients with COVID who were symptomatic with or without chest X-ray changes and hypoxia. And if you look at fever, 
dyspnea and sore throat that was significant. So for those without pneumonia, on presentation, 60% um, had fever. On presentation, without pneumonia, 7% was dyspneic. Without pneumonia, 67% had sore throat. Okay? Comparing to when they had pneumonia, but without hypoxia, well, when they had pneumonia, a much higher percentage had fever, same with dyspnea, and the sore throat declined in percentage. And when they had hypoxia, the percentage of those with fever was significantly much higher, 95%, dyspnea, 40%, and the incidence of sore throat and rhinorrhea also dropped. And this difference in these percentages were significant. Now, so what were some of the predictors for severity um, for patients that would subsequently develop more severe COVID? So Poiser Hong, uh, one of the intensivists at NCID, did this review and he submitted it also for manuscript uh, review. He found that in ICU patients, um, so the people who tended to be more unwell, they tended to be older. On presentation, they tended to report dyspnea. And they also were found to have a lower SpO2 on presentation with higher neutrophil counts. And so what were some of the markers that would raise the alarm bells that if patients were of this particular category, there is a higher chance that they would develop disease progression with COVID? Well, in particular, if the age is more than 50, if they had chronic comorbidities, if they had symptoms such as dyspnea, um, lower SpO2, chest x-ray with pneumonia, and if the CRP was greater than 60 and LDH greater than 550, lymphopenia, um, neutrophil count that was elevated, a bit of thrombocytopenia, um, elevated drop I. So I'm moving on to our treatment guidelines. So this was, um, this was, um, discussed and carved out by a group of ID doctors from various hospitals as well as key pharmacists. So the take home from our COVID treatment guidelines is that if patient is considered of a high risk of progressing to severe disease, but is currently not so severe, and it's early on in the days of illness, we will enroll in an RCT, a clinical trial first, okay? But failing which, if they're not eligible, then we'll consider them for Pelitra and in, with or without interferon, hydroxy or hydroxychloroquine, or we just observe. Okay. Now, if they had presented a little bit later and they were more than seven days from onset of illness, yes, we'll still try to enroll them in a clinical trial. But failing which, if they are not enrolled, we will do pretty much the same thing. Whether or not we offer convalescent plasma, well, plus minus. Now, if they're already in ICU with severe disease, then yes, we will try to still um, offer clinical trials, but we'll try to recruit them into the severe Gilead trial, whereby there's a 100% chance of getting remdesivir. Uh, we may consider convalescent plasma, but this has to be in a multidisciplinary discussion with ID immunologists and intensivists. It's certainly not treatment that we take um, casually. Um, now, if, there, if we feel that this is the second week and there's evidence that there's hyperinflammation syndrome, such as very high CRP, very high ferritin and high fevers, we may, we may firstly do an IL-6 level and consider offering tozolizumab. Again, discussed in a multidisciplinary setting. Now, we have had the most experience with Pelitra and interferon 1B for our initial first 100 cases. So Grace Hu, one of our pharmacists, looked at the first 43 cases and she, this is what she observed. Most of these patients, well 50%, were started on Colidra within seven days of symptoms. About 40% was also an interferon, okay? The median duration of Colidra therapy was around eight and a half days. The median number of doses of interferon was around three. Ideally, if the patient is able to tolerate it, we try to give them seven doses over a period of two weeks. In terms of adverse side effects experienced by the patients, mainly a lot of GI side effects, okay, as well as abnormal LFTs. Okay? Um, 
so what were the types of LFTs? As you can see, majority had just grade one LFT abnormality. So the ALT and AST is about 1.5 to two times upper limit of normal. A small, a small percentage had grade three or more. We're looking at more than five to 10 times upper limit of normal in terms of the LFTs, including bilirubin. So we even have had patients whereby the bilirubin went up to about 100 plus to 200 on Kaletra alone. And after we stopped Kaletra, the bilirubin just gradually came down over a period of a few days to a week. So next I'm gonna talk about um, COVID viral shedding and CT value. So this concept of cycle CT, cycle threshold value is such that, um, so Barnaby in his study, he found that at a threshold, at a CT threshold of 30 and higher, the amount of genomic sequences that could be sampled from a swab becomes almost negligible. So it almost implies that the patient is not infected, very little virus left, okay? So we certainly did or have observed that with zero CT values is that the higher it is, the better, fewer virus there, and it tends to rise with dates of illness from dates of onset of symptoms, okay? And the rate of decline also varies with degree of illness severity, or the rate of, in of increase also de uh, varies with degree of um, illness severity. So what we found was, as you can see here, three zero is the magic cutoff number. So if the CT value exceeds three zero, it tells us that the amount of virus is probably very, very negligible. And if we cultured it, we may not get anything, okay? And if we try to correlate that with whether or not the patient had pneumonia versus no pneumonia, or whether or not there was pneumonia with hypoxia, you will find that the patients with pneumonia by around the end of the first week of illness, their CT value would have exceeded 30, meaning that they're probably not so infectious, okay, or the maybe, or rather it very little virus left if we did the MP swabs. However, for people with pneumonia without hypoxia, their CT value took a little while longer, um, up to about 10 days before it became higher than 30. Now, for those that had more severe illness with hypoxia, you can see that it took right up to 21 days and they still, some of them still had a CT value that was less than 30, okay? So what does this mean for us in terms of uh, clinical interpretation and implications for us on the ground? So how we take this is that, how we interpret this is that usually um, at day 15, about 58% of our COVID patients will be PCR negative. So 58% could be discharged or be isolated, okay? By day 28, 95% of our COVID patients will be PCR negative. And therefore, 95% could be either be discharged or be isolated from COVID wards. Okay, finally, last two slides. How about potassium? We have observed amongst ourselves quite a lot of low potassium in many of our patients, including the young ones. And um, when we talk about low potassium, a lot of them have potassium that's less than 3.5. And so you look at the percentages. The percentage of patients with potassium less than 3.5 ranges between around 29 to 60%, tends to occur at a higher percentage with the older age groups, more than 60. We can't explain why. There's not a lot of nausea and vomiting with these patients. Some do have diarrhea, but the diarrhea is not significant and neither is it prolonged. So we really do not know why they have low potassium. And what about cardiac complications? So on the general ward, about 80% of our patients are very well um, um, cardiac complications are not are hardly seen actually on general ward patients, but in ICU, we probably see it the most. So personal communications with Kwasi Horn, one of our intensivists, whereby he looked at 50 ICU patients. Um, he tells me that out of this 50, two patients had atrial fibrillation, okay? Four patients were diagnosed with a non-STEMI and two patients were diagnosed with a type 2 MI, okay? Only five patients had a 2DFO done, of which their EF ranged between 40 to 60%. Okay. Um, and the range of trop I, if it was ever done, would be between 28 to 6,000. And this was only done in 17 patients. And if this was done, it would be done usually in the first week of ICU. 
and when we are symptomatic, so chest pain or um, hypotension, for instance. Okay, I'm going to end here. This is the last slide. Um, a lot of the data that you see up there today is all collated and analyzed by these various um, colleagues from National Public Health and Epidemiology Unit at the NCID. I'd also like to thank Dr. Sean Basu and Dr. Wang Chun Siong for, for the additional slides. And I'm going to just cap off by, by saying that um, I definitely agree with Dr. So. You know, it is all about teamwork. Um, when it comes to battling the COVID infection, and we are so very grateful for the amount of support we've been getting from everyone in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ling. Uh, that was fantastic. There's a uh, better el uh, elaboration uh, compared to this morning's quick uh, teleconference with Professor Liu as well. So, um, can I uh, say that we have maybe another 10 more minutes to go before I would like to close? This session, uh, I'd like to address um, most of the questions, especially those directed at Professor Cho, because I think he has to leave sharp at 1.30 for another engagement as well. Um, one quick question, um, uh, do smokers have a more severe disease progression, Dr. Ling or Dr. Cho? It's a good time for an anti-smoking campaign. That's very interesting because uh, according to the, uh, the former observation, we don't think that the smoker is more susceptible and the most Please severe. don't say that. You should say they are susceptible. Sorry. <laughs> but we <laughs> that data, you know, uh, should be scientific. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. Theoretically, okay. theoretically the, the smokers are maybe more susceptible to the uh, coronavirus, but we don't find any uh, very solid data to support that the smoker is more sus susceptible. So. Be, uh, be science. <laughs> uh, hopefully, we do. So, the, the, so far, the hypertensive patient seems more susceptible than smokers. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Koji, uh, any comments on that? Or Olam? Yeah, uh, I'm very surprised to see the last slide of uh, Dr. Ling that uh, out of 50, 50 patients, uh, six patients had a myocardial infection. It's very high percentage. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, how about the, in China? Uh, do you have uh, so many experiences of myocard infection in COVID-19 patients? And it's mm. very frequent. And inflammation may occur at the coronary artery, and which causes a rupture of the uh, unstable plaque, which led to the thrombus. Do you think that is a mechanism of the uh, acute myocardial infection in COVID-19 patients? Mm. Dr. Zhou, you have any comments? Yeah, uh, what's the percentage yeah. like in China? Yeah, just, yeah, just finished the raw data analysis yesterday. So our uh, percentage of the acute myocardial function uh, in the severe COVID-19 patient is around 1.3%. 1.3%, okay. 1.3%. Yeah, still, I think it's very high in China. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very high and uh, higher than the usual uh, percentage, even 1.3%. Yeah, so 1.3% of all the sick cases or all cases? 1.3%. All, all the cases in my hospital. We have uh, 1,400 severe COVID-19 patients in my hospital. Mm. Yeah, we have 1,400 severe COVID-19 patients in my hospital. How about the mm. this uh, what percentage in the ICU patients? What is the percentage of uh, type 2 MI based on enzymes in the ICU group of patients? Mm. Yeah. Do you have data for that? We don't have very uh, exact data in the ICU board. Uh, uh, from February from February 10 to uh, 31 March, we have four acute myocardial infarction patients in the ICU board. Uh, uh, during this time, we have over 70%, uh, 70 patients uh, monitored in the ICU. So four uh, uh, plus four uh, four, hours 70. Uh, 70, yes. Okay. That's okay. ICU board. Okay. Dr. Lam, you have any uh, Yeah, may I ask some questions? Because I, I see Dr. Ling's uh, slide also uh, in Singapore. Uh, I think that maybe you also use hydroxychloroquine. Uh, may I ask Dr. Ling and Dr. Zhao, what is your experience uh, with the hydroxychloroquine? Do you think it works? Uh, the drug hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, I have to say that uh, we've only started to use hydroxychloroquine in the past two weeks. So we do not have, I do not really have enough experience to say that it works. Honestly, I think 
I don't know if it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zhou? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, as I said, I used the hydrochloroquine in the ICU ward uh, during the past two months. It showed that uh, the hydrochloroquine might help for the severe or critically severe patient, but may not help in the mild patient. Mm. Actually, to tell the truth, I don't know. You see the treatment regimes, the way it's segregated, it seems as if people are saying um, we should start earlier rather than by the time they're sick. And I'm not too sure whether there's a lot of evidence mm. backing which drug to start early versus late. And I, yeah. I think uh, there's a lot of questions here about treatment, convalescent plasma, the role of prophylactic, prophylaxis for COVID exposure. I don't think we have enough data to, you'll be opinionitis here, so I'm, I'm very hesitant to give more guidance on the therapy at the moment. I think we should focus, I, I think I would like to quickly uh, summarize and then get everyone to say one last words, that we should focus on what we do know, which is mm. that it's really a pandemic. We, we do need to test, 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 and really isolate and quarantine the exposed uh, group to prevent further spread. So flattening the curve, like what China did, what Korea did, maintaining a low rate of infection, like what Hong Kong is doing, or what Taiwan is doing in these East Asian countries, is what everyone should be aiming for. We, we shouldn't have a doubling rate of two to three days like the US or parts of uh, Europe. That's the first thing. I think uh, previously, Holam keep talking about mass, mass, mass. So Singapore now is following mm. suit. When the prevalence rate is high in the community, everyone should be masked up protect themselves. I think that's fair. Uh, I think the healthcare workers and the community should band together to help with the effort. I think we are really frontline. And uh, because we're frontline, the adequate PPE and personal standards of care should be enforced. We should really take good care of not just ourselves, uh, but our patients uh, as well as the team. We, every time the rates of infection goes up, my fear is collateral damage for our cardiovascular patients. When the system is overwhelmed, I can't treat my AI patients, I can't treat my AMI patients well. So I would ask everyone to prevent more infections by watching out uh, for this group of patients so that we as cardiologists can continue to manage our patients. Before we jump on to postulated mechanisms and, and um, the treatment strategies like stopping ACE, ARB, I agree with Professor Koji, we should get more data first before we cause harm. Uh, by prematurely stopping proven efficacious uh, drugs or prematurely jumping on bandwagon to push for convalescent plasma and all that. Every treatment has risk, especially in some of the more elderly patients. I think some of the antivirals and hydroxychloroquine can potentially cause harm in uh, cardiovascular group of patients. So uh, with that, I'm going to go around and uh, get uh, everyone to summarize. We'll get uh, Professor Zhou Ning to say something first before he leaves. Professor Cho? Yeah, mm, uh, sorry, because I have another webinar at uh, no 1.30, so I, I'm so sorry for, for the, the, the um, because I, mm, yeah, um, thank you so much for having me here, and uh, it's my great honor to share my experience, is bad or is good or is bad. The, yeah, I, I, sh I mean, uh, the greatest concern of mine is to keep ourselves safe, right? So I hope everyone, uh, especially for your frontline uh, medical doctors like Dr. Ling, Dr. Ho, and uh, Dr. Koji, please be sure to keep yourself very safe and uh, be sure to to wear the, the N95 mask before you have a very close contact with uh, confirmed or highly suspected case, uh, cases. So that's very, very important. Uh, before you take care of the patient to pre protect yourself very, very well. That's what I want to say and want to share with you. Thank you so much. That's coming from Thank personal you. experience when someone is recovered from COVID. Dr. Lampo, you want to uh, have a final word? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jack. It's my honor to be here and I'm very uh, thankful and grateful to learn from all the experts and uh, yeah, very fruitful experience this time. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ling, um, your concluding okay, remarks. Very grateful for this opportunity to actually share and learn with everyone. I've learned really so many things just by listening to your comments alone. I can can only just echo Dr. Zhou. That seems to be what I'm doing today, echoing what his his sentiments. Um, 
yes, we have to protect ourselves. And I know somebody just recently reminded me that even if some a patient is collapsing in front of you, do not rush in. Make sure that we have the correct protection. Make sure that we are properly protected. Put things on properly. It takes time to do that before we go in because as frontliners, you know, if we are down, it doesn't help, doesn't do anybody any favors at all. That's all. Professor Koji, your final concluding remarks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for all. Uh, discussion was very nice. And uh, China, congratulations for China already overcome the COVID-19. Now the other part, yes. the COVID-19 infection is increasing. So uh, we need to learn a lot from your valuable experiences. Uh, thank you very much. So again, I'd um, uh, like to end by thanking all the callers. I think we had 5,000 uh, call-ins and uh, almost 450 stayed all the way to the end now. And uh, that's quite amazing. So you guys and the faculty as well as presenters, Professor Cho and Dr. Ling have, and uh, Professor Koji has done a wonderful job engaging the audience. So I'd like to thank my faculty, thank the participants, and again, uh, thank um, uh, Roche for collaborating with APSC and ICT to jointly organize this uh, educational webinar. We hope to do more useful webinars for the participants. So please uh, log in and give us a suggestion on how to improve on this webinar and the type of topics that you want us to focus on. So with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone. Keep safe, mask up. Okay. You can smoke <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, okay. Tobacco is safe. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Bye -bye. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.